So this is the second of a series of lectures about cross-sectional uh, inference methods using R. And I wanted to center this lecture on reinforcing some of the things that we talked about in the first lecture and also demonstrating uh, the differences between vectors, matrices, and data frames in R. So what I want to show you first is, is just a reminder of how R processes data. And so I want to show you a vector. You made a vector on problem set one, and let's make a vector called Z. So just as a reminder, R is case specific. So I'm going to do a capital Z. That is different from a lowercase z. So and this also applies for, uh, say, functions. So when I call the function data.frame, it matters whether or not the D is capitalized. So in some programming languages, uh, letters are not case specific. R, R is not one of those languages. So let's look at just Z here and let's call the vector. Okay. So the less than minus sign is an indication that I want to assign a function and I'm just going to create a vector using this function. It's going to have four values, one through four, three, four, three, two, one, two, one, one, one. Okay, so we're going to create a vector. And I'm going to run it right out of the uh, R script dialog. So let's run it. And you can see that it shows up as values. Maybe I want to treat the vector as a factor. So Suppose that the values of the vector have some qualitative information. I can capture that with what's called a factor function. So let's call it ZF, F for factor. It doesn't matter what you call it. This is a factor function. Now R is telling you in this function um, what data you're going to be assigning factors to and what the label of those factors are. So we're just using our vector z and the labels are a vector of labels so you hit equal c let's just call it good comma better best extra best I know the extra best isn't a thing, but let's just pretend that it is. So I run it, and it's still a vector, but now I'm, I'm treating the vector as something with four levels. So it's related to these things that I had previously, but I'm treating the vector as a factor. Let's take a look at the vector. So I can just type it into the console. I don't necessarily have to put it in my R script, but let's just type in ZF. What is that? Best, extra best, best, better, good, better, good, good. And you can see that R assigned the labels to the vector in numeric order, despite the fact that I didn't put the numbers in any particular order. So this is helpful if you think about having data on a Likert scale, which may be one through five, I can encode some qualitative information to go along with it. And I don't have to be super particular about the order. Now, I can, I can manipulate the factor function in order to uh, assign labels in different types of orders, but that's not a requirement here.
Okay, so this is just something I want us to keep in mind as we learn to program more with R in that we can actually perhaps uh, take a look at, so if I were to double click on the ZF, let's just go to the environment here. Now, now I'm over here. I can see that it has these factors. Okay, so this is not the only thing I want to do in R. I wanted to go back to some of what we might think to do on problem set two, and that's multiply matrices together. So what I want to show you in this video ultimately is how R both produces the regression output um, automatically, but also how we can use R to do matrix operations associated with that output. So let's suppose we have eight uh, values of Y. It's a matrix. Okay, so we've learned that there's this thing called matrix multiplication. Matrices are different from vectors. They behave differently. So I treat them differently in R. So while Z is a vector, I want to treat Y as a matrix. And I use the function matrix. And I'm going to concatenate together the values of the matrix. So let's have it go up like this. I have these values for my matrix. 1, 3, one, three 6, 7, 9, 11, 14, 20. Now, take a look at the, um, I guess, associated arguments of the matrix function. You can see that for the data equal, I have replaced the first argument with the data that I want. But I need to tell R what kind of matrix this is. So. Because it's a data matrix, uh, I think of this as being an 8 by 1 column matrix. So the number of columns is 1 and the number of rows is 8. So if I say that the matrix has n row equal to 8, I can do that. I can run it. And then I can double click on that. You can view it in R and you can see that it looks like this. So I'm going to type that R created a or an eight by one matrix for me. Let me now. What if instead? I were to treat it as the same thing but use the number of column definition as one. Okay? So I use the number of column, I run it. Okay, you can see that it shows up in the console. Let's double click on it we can look, we can see that it created the same matrix. Okay, so R still created an 8 by 1 matrix. Now, let's go back here. Let's go into the console, actually. We can copy this right out of the console. Now, let's say we had the number of columns equal to 2. What does that look like? Let's run it. Okay. Now, R put the first four values of our data set in the first column and the last four in the second value. So R reads data in as columns first. Okay, and I think that that is something we need to keep in mind. But let's Let's go back and run this first one here and change it back to what we want. And I'll cut and paste this part of the code up here. And 
describe it a little bit. R now creates a 4 by 2 matrix where the first four listed values are in the first column, the last four are in the second column. So, we have a matrix. If we think about uh, calculating the slope and intercept of the line, we can use this as part of it. Okay, so now let's suppose we have some data on X and we want to use an X matrix to do matrix multiplication with. So, X, it's also a matrix. I'm going to use the C function, okay? Let's say I have three columns of data for eight observations. So I have 24 total values. The first is the intercept. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. The second, think of it as a binary variable, maybe uh, whether or not you meet the criteria. So it only takes the value 0 and 1. And then think of the next as being something quantitative. So 15, 19, 21, 20, 18, 31, 42, 59. Okay, so I have, I'm thinking of this as being the intercept. I'm thinking of this as being x1, and I'm thinking of this as being x2. I need to tell R that, so the number of columns I have is equal to 3. And here, R creates... R will create an eight row by three column matrix. And I know that because R defined the number of columns to uh, be three. Now, I don't have to necessarily type the data in in this order. I could add column by column, but I, I need to use a C bind or R bind function. So once I have this, this matrix, I can augment the matrix by adding more rows or more columns using different functions in R. But for right now, we're just going to leave the data as it is. All right, so let's run it. Okay, and let's take a look at it. And you can see this is the intercept. Think of that as, as being the, the, um, the x variable. So what I actually want to do here is I want to have a few more ones. So I'm going to rerun it. This is just example. Okay. So you can see that that we have we have created a, a number of of different matrices. Okay. Now, so this is an eight by three matrix. In order to calculate the intercept and the slope, we need to do x transpose x inverse x transpose y. R can transpose the matrix for us. Let's just call it xt for transpose. This function is t of x. Okay, this creates a transpose matrix. So the t function within R will transpose a matrix. Let's run it. Let's take a look at it. And you can see the dimensionality of the matrix change. So here we have eight rows. Now we only have three. Here we had three columns. Now we have eight. Let's take a look at our data. And you can see that we actually did transpose our data. R will multiply the matrices together for us. So let's call it XTX. I just take T of X, which is XT. I do percent star percent. So if I just do star, I am doing a different type of matrix multiplication than if I put the percent signs. And I want to do the matrix multiplication. We're running. Okay. And here we have our matrix multiplication. So the percent star percent is how we multiply matrices together in R. Okay, 
Now, we can also invert a matrix in R. It's with what's called the solve function. So often we think of doing matrix multiplication as a tool to solve a system of linear equations. So if I have four equations and four unknowns, it's really difficult to do continuous substitution of one variable into another variable and to solve for x1 and then solve for x2 and then solve for x3 and solve for x4, it may be more simple to do matrix multiplication where ax equals b. And then we, we, we solve for this by inverting a matrix. Okay, so let's call it x transpose x inverse. Okay, again. And I'm just going to type in solve x tx. Okay, let's solve it. Run it. Okay. I have solved it here. Now, the solve function will invert a matrix. When we multiply x transpose x times x transpose inverse, we're going to get what's called an identity matrix with ones down the diagonal of the matrix and zeros everywhere else. OK, so we could solve for beta right now with the information that we have. This is x transpose x inverse percent multiply percent times x transpose percent multiply percent times y. Okay. This is the intercept. This is the slope on the first one. This is the slope on the second one. Okay. And this, we find the coefficients of x and of the intercept. Let me just slope on x1 slope on x2. And I use this example to note the power of r. Okay, now let's just verify. Let's put this into a data frame. Let's call it, um, let's just call it data1. Okay, I'm going to use the data frame function and I'm just going to have y and x. Okay, Take a look at it. Now, R doesn't need me to include x1 in a model. I need it in order to invert matrices, but if I use R to run the regression, R includes it automatically. So what we did here is we made we made a matrix or a data frame out of two matrices. And I'm going to use regression one to make a linear model that includes the data from data one. So I'm going to have y as a function of x2 and x3. Why not x1? R automatically includes x1. Okay, so if we include it again, we're going to have two of the same variable in there, which is unnecessary. Okay. Let's run it. Okay, R has created a regression for me. So let's go back to the... Estimated a relation, a regression model with x2 
index 3 are automatically includes x1. Automatically includes x1. Okay, now let's do a summary of the regression model. So let's just see what it provides for us. Let's run it. Okay, and let's take a look here. You see the estimate of the intercept, you see the estimate for x2, and you see the estimate for x3. Let's compare that to the betas. Here's the estimate for the intercept, here's the estimate for x2, here's the estimate for x3. So whether we use R's internal regression function or matrix multiplication, we can find beta in the same way. Okay, what about these standard errors? Can we find standard errors in R as well? Is that a possibility for us? And the answer is yes, it is a possibility for us. So in order to do that, we would like to be able to calculate some predictions. We need to calculate some errors. And then we need to do things like calculate the regression variance. So we're going to try those out. Let's first think about how we could find the predictions in R. So what I would like to do is plug different values of X into the line that I've made and multiply times the intercept, the slope for X2 and the slope for X3. I could do this. Okay, what I can do is transpose the beta matrix and multiply it times X transpose. So if we take a look at X transpose here, if I have a beta matrix that's three by one, I can multiply it by this transpose matrix that is three by eight. Or I'm sorry, if I have a beta, beta transpose matrix that's one by three, I can multiply it by X transpose, which is three by eight, and I'll get a one by eight measure of predictions. So let's try that out. Let's call it uh, beta T. And that's just the transpose of the beta matrix. And what we're up to here is transpose the beta matrix for some predictions. And then what I'm going to do after that is just call predict. And that's going to be beta transpose percent multiply percent times x transpose. So we're gonna we're gonna run these lines of code here, run them. Okay. And it's and as you can see we we didn't there's an error here, okay? The error is that I didn't assign it a function. So you can see R is trying to tell us something. Comparison is only possible for atomic and list types. I'm just making a comparison. I'm actually assigning a function here and R calls me out on it. Okay, so R's internal error controls are helpful. All right, there's the predictions. Okay, if I transpose the prediction matrix, I can subtract it from Y to get the error terms. Now I want to point out in the council that we are going to have some error terms. So what I want to do is compare and contrast the errors that I produce with the residuals that R produces. Okay, so we're going to load our... And let's just call this predict... T for transpose is going to be the transpose of the prediction matrix. And then for the errors, we will take the Y and just subtract the prediction transpose matrix. Let's run it, okay? Now let's check out the error matrix here. See, there they are. Check out these errors. Let's go back to the console. 
you can see that the errors that I created line up with the errors that are created. This is not arbitrary. This is how it works. So we think of error as being data minus prediction. This is how far away the points are from the line. But it has a special meaning in this context because actually the line is a hyperplane going through three-dimensional space. And this is measuring how far not just x2 is, but x3 as well. How far is that observation away from the line that I estimated? So here is something where R can make a number of predictions for us quickly, but we might start to have difficulty doing this in Excel. OK, so what we have done so far is we have made some errors, we've made some predictions, we fit a line through the data. And as you can see here, R also produces what are called standard errors. OK, so the standard errors allow us to estimate the relationship between each independent variable and y and see whether or not that relationship is an accurate depiction of uh, a true relationship based on the information that we have. So as we can see here, that here is our estimate for x2 as it relates to y. So changing from 0 to 1 for x2 increases y by 1.58. But the test statistic associated with it is pretty close to 0. And so there, there's a pretty high chance that there's no relationship. But when we look at x3, a one unit increase in x3 leads to a 0.34 increase in y. The test statistic there is, is, is almost 4. And R indicates that this is statistically significant just outside the point of one level. So ideally, we'd like to be able to use R to construct these standard errors. OK, and, and so we can. Now, if we go back to the slides associated with this, uh, let's just have a look at the slides. I have them here in. Uh, they're also on course den. But let's just take a look at the, the slides here. So in order to find the standard errors, I need to find the regression variance, which is sigma square hat. And that is the error matrix transpose times the errors divided by n minus k. But this is super smooth in R. So in R, I have an error matrix. All I need to do is transpose it, and I can multiply it by 1 over n minus k, where k is the number of parameters we estimate, the intercept and the slopes. Here we have a total of 3, actually. I feed that right into x transpose x inverse, which I already have in R. So by saving these different matrices, I really simplify calculating even complex things like these standard errors. OK, so let's try it out. Let's go back to the, the console here. And I'm going to make an error transpose matrix. And that's just T of the errors. And then what I want to do is multiply these two things together. But I'm also going to multiply times n minus 1 over n minus k. We have eight total observations. We're estimating one parameter for the intercept, one for x2, and one for x3. So we have 1 over, we have 1 fifth, we have 0.2 times this error matrix. Let's call that regression var. So we're going to run it. Now take a look at this regression var. It's a matrix. It's a matrix. So I take sigma square times this this is the, the error transpose 
times the errors, this is the sum of squared errors. The 0.2 is 1 over n minus k, but R treats this as a matrix. So when I go to calculate sigma square times x transpose x inverse, I have a dimensionality problem because R treats it as a matrix, but really I want to treat it as a scalar. Okay, so how do I fix this problem? We use what's called the as vector function. So here what we did is we generated the sum of squared errors and constructed regression variance i.e. 1 over n minus k times the error transpose times the error. But when we did that, you can see that the regression variance, even though it looks like a scalar, it's actually a matrix, okay? And so this is an you know, as I, as I mouse over it, this is just a comment. So how do we uh, change that? Let's just call this regression bar one. And we're going to use the as vector regression bar. So I'm telling R to treat this as a vector. Once it treats it as a vector, I can multiply it right on through. Okay, so I'm going to do that. You can see I'm going to generate something new, but where it's going to show up are these values. Okay, so I'm doing it right out of the R script. Run it. You can see that the same thing that was up here is now a value. Okay, so I'm going to go back down here. I'm going to hit, give myself a little bit more space here. I can now feed this regression var1 directly into the inverse matrix to calculate the variance of beta1 given x. And for the test statistic, I actually need the square root of it. So I can take the square root of the inverse matrix right here. So let's call this standard error. And I'm going to take regression var 1 and multiply it times x tx inverse raised to the 0.5. OK, I'm going to do that here. Let's run it. That is standard error. Okay, let's take a look at the standard errors here. Let's take a look at the standard errors and see if maybe we can I think we actually did not take the square root of this. So let, let me try one more time to get the square root of, of this number here. And I think I know what the problem is. I think what I wanted to do was take this whole thing and, and, and raise it to the 0.5. So let's try it again. There we go. I think this is better. Okay. Sorry. I ordered an operations mistake right here, but take a look at the standard errors. Okay. Let's go back to the summary of regression ones. Just type it right into the console. Okay. 
we have generated the same standard errors that R did right here. So matrix multiplication can also generate the standard errors needed to test the hypothesis. Okay, and so if we just go back and look right here into the R script, this as vector turned the matrix into a vector. Once we have a vector, we can multiply it into the matrix like a scalar, then raise it raise to 0.5 to take square root. This generates the same standard errors as R. So what I want us to do here is think that maybe R can construct this stuff for us, but I want us to appreciate what R is doing. Now, another thing that we did in class is mention that R can make heteroscedasticity um, consistent standard errors. And if you take a look at it, it is just super obnoxious formula right here. But in R, it's extremely simple. It's extremely simple. So what I can do is create a diagonal matrix of these squared errors, which I already have in R. I have the errors, so I just need to square them. Let's call it errors error squared equals errors squared. Okay, I'm going to run that. Here are my squared errors. And then I can make a diagonal matrix of these squared errors using what's called the diagonal function in R. So let's just call it diag. The diagonal function of R, what it does is it will just produce a matrix with zeros on the off diagonal and the squared errors on the diagonal. So I can make a diagonal matrix for any uh, column matrix in R by just referring to the column matrix with the C function. Let's try it out here. And you can see what I did here. The errors, I'll show you the errors. Here are the errors. And then the diagonal matrix, this minus 2.65 that you see here is squared here and the minus 2.003 is squared here, etc. Now, I can make heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors just from this diagonal matrix. Take a look at the formula. I have n is uh, the number of observations I have in the data set. I have 8 fifths, and I can multiply that. That's 8 is the number of observations, and I'm estimating k parameters, which is 3. So I have 8 over 8 minus 3. That's 8 fifths. I have x transpose x inverse in the data set. I have x transpose in the data set. I have the diagonal matrix in the data set. I have x, and then I have x transpose x inverse again. So I can actually make a heteroscedasticity consistent errors. And I just take 1.6 times. I'm going to put all this to the to the one half um, x transpose x inverse times x transpose times my new diagonal matrix times x times x transpose x inverse and I can raise all of this to the 0.5 so I can change my standard errors to potentially be consistent with there being different variation of the points around the line for different values of x and this can be especially important when I have a bunch of different x values where 
maybe I have heteroscedasticity along one dimension, but not another dimension. So I'm just going to run it. And you can see here that there, there, was, a, there was an unexpected um, time sign. So let's see where that, that shows up. I think instead of typing in the percent, I have dollar signs. So you can see that R is trying to tell me I made a, I made a mistake. R is pretty good about telling us that. All right, there are errors. You can see that we have replaced the previous standard errors with these new errors. We've changed them a little bit. So these were the old. These are the new. Okay. And what I want to get across is, is not that we're going to be using matrix multiplication. I know this is, is quite a long lecture about matrix multiplication in R, and it's very intimidating to see all of this math. The goal is not to intimidate the people with math. The goal is to show you that the stuff that R is doing on the back end could be done by R on the front end with matrix multiplication. So when R is producing these estimates, when we, you know, in the next lecture, we're, we're not going to use matrix multiplication anymore. We're just going to load data into R and estimate regression models. And we're going to fix the standard errors as we need to. But R is actually fixing them using um, technology like this. And so this is, this is an important concept here. Now, whenever we generate in our script, we want to save it. So I'm just going to save it here. We'll call it matrix. And so I could go ahead and then the next time I, let's say I, I clear out my environment. Okay, I do want to remove everything from the environment. And then let's say I clear out the console. Okay, so it's all gone from the console then what I can do with this file is I can just go ahead and run the whole file. And let me let me look to see. Let's run everything. I run everything, you just highlight everything. And R automatically reproduces the same output that we had before. Okay, so just to see it one more time, I, I get rid of everything out of the environment. I get rid of everything out of the console. And then I just start with the first line of code. I highlight everything. You run it, and it's all reproduced right here in the environment. That's the point of saving the script. So we save the script so that we have a place to work from when we're done doing work in R. And so, so this is something that we're gonna, gonna do uh, moving forward. I would encourage you to consider using R to solve problem set two. So I don't think that there's any reason why we can't use R as a tool to solve the matrix multiplication problems associated with problem set two, and I'd encourage you to do it.